Hello, my name is Peter Sharoshi. I am the director of the Rice Reporter Foundation and the editor of the Drug Reporter website. And uh, we are uh, sitting here at the uh, global village of the International AIDS uh, Conference in Amsterdam. And today uh, I have two guest speakers, uh, Ferenc Bajinski, who is from the AIDS Action Europe, and uh, uh, Tomasz Berecki, who is from EUPATI. Uh, European Patients Academy for Therapeutic Innovation. Therapeutic Innovations. Both of them have been working in uh, LGBT and HIV activism for quite a while. So today we will be discussing uh, uh, what are the gaps in uh, uh, HIV awareness in the LGBT movement and how to bridge uh, these gaps. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to ask you, Ferry, uh, uh, about your presentation you uh, delivered yesterday here at the conference about low prevalence countries, so-called low prevalence countries in the uh, eastern, uh, central and southern part of Europe, uh, where HIV rates are traditionally lower than in, in other parts of Europe. But uh, yesterday you were speaking about uh, that, that the change in the situation, that this situation is now rapidly changing. Can you, can you tell us about that? Um, yes, so in the um, Central European and Southeast European countries, we see uh, the total numbers are really low. That's why, you know, it's low prevalence. Everyone is happy. Everyone thinks it's a lucky situation and they are doing nothing about it. So, but at the same time, what we see that in the last 10 years, there has been a 300% increase in new infections among gay men and other MSM. And we have no real data about sex workers. We don't have real data about transgender people. IDUs, etc., etc. So it's an alarming situation. And yesterday I had a chance to speak at the panel, which was um, the health commissioner was there from the European Union, some ministries of health or deputy ministers. And it was kind of celebrating that Europe is going in the right direction. We are reaching the 1990 targets. And if you look at the European Union data, it is actually very close to the 90. It's in the high 80s or even over 90. But if you break it down to individual countries, then you will see that in, in Hungary, for instance, we have very bad data. The ministry reported almost 90% of people being tested and then 45% being on antiretroviral. At the same time, the country has a test and treat policy. So what is happening in between? The data is bad. The presentation of the data is even worse because it's clearly leaving some regions behind. So I, I almost said yesterday that um, Central Europe is the Eastern Europe of the European Union because it's just nobody cares. There is no funding. National governments, you, you know more about that, that they, they have spent zero on prevention and services for uh, key populations in Hungary for years now. International donors are not there because they think that the European Union is doing their job, giving money to civil society and building capacities. But the truth is that the, um, just to apply for a grant from the European Union, you either A, have to be promoted by your national government, which is not happening in most of the countries because governments like to work with easy civil society who are not advocating for rights of people. Or if, even if you can apply for a project, you don't have the capacity for the administration, etc. It's, it's a nightmare to, uh, to administer a European Union uh, project. So um, the last man standing was actually the, the um, OSF, the Soros Foundation, but you know, we don't have to talk much about what kind of attack is and demonizing of the Soros Foundation, not just in Hungary, but also in Macedonia and other countries. So that was, the feedback was that it was really a timely call and we need to do something, make sure that not only the big countries and some luckier countries like Slovenia, Slovenia is very active, they have, they have most of the projects in place or, or starting, even local governments are supporting people living with HIV with projects. Um, yeah, it, it was a timely call that we really have to look into it and make sure that even in those countries where the government is inactive or actively blocking HIV-related work, that we can make sure that civil society and communities can be involved in these projects and learn via networking from each other. Can you talk more about this, uh, that you said that the data we have is, are not reliable, so is it because the governments are like uh, playing or manipulating this data, cosmetic, making some cosmetics of the data, or is it because of the data collection system doesn't work well? Um, I'm not sure about the data collection system. There, is there a national epidemiology center any longer or not? So it's, you know, 
the National Epidemiology Center, I think, was one of the uh, technical institutions who sometimes made statements that were not in favor of the government, so they basically shut them down, integrated them under the ministry so they don't have the freedom to speak about things. Um, what I think about the data is that there is this um, Dublin monitoring going on, which is organized by the ECDC, and national governments are required to report, I think, annually or biannually. In the past, it was a requirement that national governments included civil society in the reporting. Now it's a recommendation. So what is happening in some of the countries, including Hungary, civil society is not part of the report, it is done by the ministry. And I think they have no idea what they are doing. For instance, there, uh, it's from 2015 to 2016, there has been a change in the reporting. And they are reporting that Hungary is providing free of charge antiretrovirals for undocumented migrants. I think they didn't understand the question, that's the problem. So, and there is no control. You can talk to ECDC and they will say that, sorry, this is the data we have to work with because that's what your national government is reporting. So there is real need for shadow reporting via other channels because otherwise this data is just uh, useless and, and really making a false picture of, of the countries. So the, the existing, from the existing data we have, we can conclude that this uh, epidemic is largely driven, at least in these countries, by uh, uh, infections among men who have sex with men. So is this issue addressed uh, within the LGBTQ movement uh, in these countries? Uh, can we, do they speak openly about this issue? Do they do something uh, to, 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 to respond to this epidemic? No. <laughs> Um, and to some extent, yes. So there's also, I think that there has been some change happening now uh, in the recent, literally in the recent weeks or months. But traditionally, H Hungarian LGBT organizations, and I will not include the Q very consciously because I don't think that these organizations are queer. I think that they are, they are LGBT organizations or even, even more just LG organizations and bisexual and, and, uh, and trans communities and intersex people are completely invisible. Um, not just in Hungary, in our region, this is, this is a traditional problem. Um, so um, they do not engage so much in, in HIV uh, related or, or even comorbidities related work. And um, this is actually, this is a historical tradition which dates back to the debates that happened uh, in this community um, many years ago, also in the West, uh, you know that there is this association of, of, of stigma and discrimination with HIV and with being uh, MSM or being gay, um, or, or, or lesbian for that matter, but let's concentrate on gay people now. Um, the, um, so one argument says that you should not associate HIV with um, uh, being gay or with with, uh, with 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 a gay identity, because that will reinforce stigma. While we say, especially we people living with HIV, that um, in a region where 80% of people living with HIV are MSM, are men having sex with other men, it is it is the issue of the gay community. It is a problem that the gay community must deal with because HIV decimates our community. So if I say that HIV is not part of the gay community, then that is what reinforces stigma. That is, I mean, it's exactly the other way around in our opinion, because this sends the message that I, as a gay man living with HIV, I am not part of the gay community. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm also excluded by my own people. So I think this is, um, or I feel excluded by my own people. So I think that this is a misguided strategy. Uh, but I also have uh, the impression now that there is some change, some, some fresh air uh, coming, coming into this. Um, and you know, let's face it, as Ferenc says, this is also, um, this is also a funding issue. So, um, and unfortunately, which goes together with the, with the whole crisis of civil society in our region, um, all, also gay organizations or, or, or LGBT organizations will go in the direction where the money flows. So if there's no money in HIV prevention, they will not do HIV prevention. Um, often, which is sad, so it's not like I, you know, it's not like I support this practice. So I think that you should first 
choose your priorities and then find funding for that instead of fun finding funding and then do whatever there's funding for. So, um, I, I, but 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 still, I can see some some rudimental change starting or emerging in this field. Like, for example, the largest LGBT organization um, in, in Hungary, Hattir, is starting their PrEP project now, which I think is tremendously good and very timely, uh, even a bit late, but it's, I mean, it's, it's good that it's happening. Can you explain what PrEP is? Oh, yes, sure. I mean, PrEP is a pre-exposure prophylaxis which is a pill that uh, currently one pill, and there are also clinical trials going on about other compounds, but it's one particular pill that you take uh, on a regular basis and that prevents that you get infected by HIV. Now this is, this is tremendously important and valuable because this means that on the one hand, if I, as a person living with HIV, if I take my treatment, we know now since yesterday when the, the latest results of the Partner 2 study came out, that it's, it's practically absolutely certain that if I take my medic medicine, I do not infect other people. So I can have unprotected condomless sex and I will not transmit the virus. Um, now, on the other hand, if a person not living with HIV takes PrEP, takes prevention, the prevention pill, then he or she cannot contract HIV. So this means that we have every tool and we have the right scientific evidence to stop the epidemic. Now it's only the political will and the cooperation of all stakeholders that is necessary to really stop the epidemic. So it's not, the science is done. Does that answer your question? Good. So, uh, and what would you answer to those people who say that you know this is now not maybe not the, the most you know, priority issue? We have other things to spend money on. It's too expensive to pay for prep for people. So, what, what would what would you say to that? What do you say to that? Um, prep is not expensive. You can buy generic prep, which is as effective as the as the original one, the branded one. I think it's also very important to to um, to say that if you're having sex by using a condom or you are on treatment which is virally suppressed treatment or you're taking PrEP this is all three is protected sex so we should move out the you know if you take up the condom there's this concept that it's unprotected no it's protected because you are on treatment it's because you are on PrEP etc um, I don't have a good answer for why should we spend money here and not there um, I think that we should all, regardless of we are working on HIV issues or LGBT issues or drug user issues or other social issues, we should join together and together demand more funding for these issues because, you know, if you just fund here but not there, then it's not going to get there where we, where we want to go. You, you know, you can, you can address women issues and then leave everyone else behind or you can address gay issues and then leave other people behind. It's, it's, it's not the solution. We all together. I think it, it is really high time that um, people who are working on social issues and, and advocating for the rights of people and communities is to sit down together, have our conversation, and then you know come up with a joint advocacy and joint plan. On we are doing our job, but but we are not you know seeing each other as competition. That would be important. Um, I, I think that there's. I, I have two points to make here. One is look around, look around here. I mean, if you look around here, if you look at this incredible buzz that's going on, which is actually typical for every AIDS conference, but this is also, this time, um, somehow it's, I mean, it's very impressive to see how many people, how, how many different communities are represented. And what binds us together here is accidentally HIV. But in fact, it's, it, because many of us actually live with HIV, but in fact, it is, it's by accident, and it just shows that there's much more than that, that what we have in common. So yes, we, we hear, we often hear this criticism about identity politics and, you know, the, the overemphasis of human rights and what about class and, you know, class issues and whatever. But if you look around here, and also because HIV is biological, it's, it's something that I carry in my body. I live together with another entity. So it's absolutely biological. And it defines, it does define my position 
in, in, in society. So why not use this opportunity, as Ferry says, for working together, for finding those common avenues where we can reduce or through which we can reduce inequalities in health, but also in society um, uh, in general. And the other point I want to make about this is why do we accept this, this notion that healthcare is a zero-sum game? So that if you finance PrEP, then you will not be able to finance oncology. Or if you finance cancer cure or, or cancer treatment, then there's no more money left for um, multiple sclerosis. Why? That's, I mean, that's absolute nonsense. And also, why do we accept it for, for, for granted that uh, HIV treatment and HIV prevention should be from the same pot? Why? <laughs> I mean, it's not even it's not even treatment. If you don't live with HIV, you're not. I mean, you're not infected with HIV, and you want to prevent that you're infected with HIV. Why? Why is that HIV treatment? It's not. It's a different thing. So let's start. Let's let's you know. Let's handle these things separately, and and thereby we can also take a completely new approach to prevention and healthcare uh, con concerning HIV. There is one other uh, issue which is widely discussed now in the harm reduction community. I wanted to ask you about that, it's, and it's chemsex. Uh, and uh, I d we don't really have much data about it as far as I know. But do you have like any information about how widely spread this phenomenon is in our countries, in our region, in Central Eastern Europe, and how much uh, it contributes to this large uh, increase in, uh, in the rates of HIV among men who have sex with mm. men? Um, it's only partly true that we don't have data, because data are coming out now uh, from, the, from the EMIS and the ECHOES studies, uh, which was conducted over the last two, one and a half years, um, and the first results were presented the day before yesterday here at this conference. Um, now, the first data will be published. Um, uh, IMIS, IMIS is actually a, a major um, internet-based survey of, um, of the health of men having sex with men across Europe, everywhere, in all countries of Europe, um, which was conducted in um, 30 languages over, the, over a period of, I think, eight months. So the data collection was really massive. Um, 140,000 people completed the, uh, the questionnaire. And it's a massive effort to analyze this data. And a large chunk of the questionnaire was concerned with substance use uh, and sex, uh, and the and the confluence of substance use and sex, or chemsex, as you as you as you rightly call it. So these data will come out, and then we will see um, what the extent of this of this is. But let me tell you this, I think that, um, and I, I say this also as a former substance user, and I've been involved in the chemsex scene for a long time, I was involved in the chemsex scene for a long time, I think we still do not acknowledge the importance of this. We still do as if this wasn't an, uh, an, an issue, uh, while it is an issue, especially in our region where drugs have become very cheap, very easy to access. Um, and gay sex has always been there, so it's, you know, and, it, and we know that sex is good, drugs can be fun, um, sex and drugs can also be fun to a certain point, and then it destroys you. So I, I think that, so it's partly true, yes, we don't have data, but data are coming, coming now, and I think that we underestimate the importance of this issue. Yeah, and just to add to this, the um, I think that we don't have so much data from Hungary on chemsex compared to the Netherlands or even Germany is because drugs are illegal. Drug use is criminalized. This is also make it difficult to have any harm reduction programs because you know if, if something is happening in the, in, the, in a chemsex scene, who do you call? Do you call the ambulance and you know or? And then there is this threat of being criminalized and then put into prison or whatever, paying a fine. Um, I think that we really have to, uh, when it comes to chemsex, that the LGBT, HIV, and drug user movement has to work on it together because drug user movement have been advocating for the decriminalization of, of drug use. And if you decriminalize something, it immediately reduces the vulnerabilities of the people who are in that action. Because I think that 
we are not vulnerable. We are not vulnerable as gay men or sex workers, and some of the most fierce people are sex workers who are, who are around here. What, what creates vulnerabilities is the legal systems and the discriminating policies. And this is the thing that I was talking about working together and, you know, instead of doing our things in silos, we should, we should join forces and, and, um, and work together on creating safe legal environments where harms can be reduced just by, just by having the right policies. And having all these harm reduction services and, and tools that we were talking about, PrEP, treatment as prevention, needle and syringe exchange programs available and legal. Can I, can, I, can I add one more thing to this, which is, again, typical for the whole region and not just Hungary? Um, maybe not so much in Slovenia, and, and you're right, they have been doing some excellent work. But, you know, I had, I had several meetings with harm reductionists in, um, in Hungary, uh, people working in traditional harm reduction, and I was lecturing about uh, camp sex and what it means for, for the individual, what it means for the, for the gay community, also for the lesbian communities, by the way. Um, and and I, what I found was that these organizations are so stretched, they are in such a difficult situation right now, that they don't even know what to do with traditional substance use. So it's just that they lack the capacity to understand and work properly in something as new and, and unconventional as chemsex would be. So we need to do a lot of groundwork also with harm reduction organizations to, to make them understand what the patterns are, what chemsex actually entails, so what it, what it means, because it's a completely different pattern of, of substance use from what they, what they usually work with, and what interventions make sense. And then, only then, can we start thinking about how you organize those interventions. That's, that's, that's the next step. So we are even behind that first step that, that, uh, that Ferry was talking about. Okay. So before finishing our conversation, do you have any other highlights from this conference uh, about gaps and how to bridge them or any message you will take back home from this conference? Why are there so many, so, so, so few people, sorry, from our region? You know, this is, this is, this is really painful. Like, I know that one doctor from Hungary is here, because um, I heard that he's here, but um, I, I haven't met him. And I, it's just, why are there so, why, it's, it's, it's really time that we, that, we, that we start taking this seriously, as also Ferry pointed out, the numbers are terrible, <laughs> and and the and the attention is not is not there. So that's I mean one of the biggest highlights for me is that we came here. We were waiting for this conference to happen in Europe for so many years. It's happening in Europe, and I don't see the benefit for our region. That's that's my biggest pain, <laughs> and also my biggest point. Um, for me, one of the highlights was that I attended the Beyond Blame conference. It was a, before, the, before the actual IES conference. It was addressing the issue of HIV criminalization, criminalization of HIV exposure. So if you expose someone to HIV in some countries, you end up in prison. Um, you don't disclose your status. And although you are taking all the, that we were talking about, you are on treatment and not infectious, or you're using a condom, and still you can be charged with, with, with penalty. That was, that was a very interesting and very um, energizing conference. We heard um, personal stories of people who have been incarcerated, and they are still wearing the I'm a sexual offender on their driving license. Because in, in the US they put it on your driving license, so the police can see already that you have been. And what happened to him? He was having a monogamous relationship with someone, and because of exposure, uh, he ended up in prison. Um, also, the outcome of this uh, of this meeting was that we really have to stop working in silos. And even when, and, and of course, what Tomasz was saying is completely right. Most of the organizations, because of the shrinking space, we are moving where the funding is coming from. So we are writing our applications according to the call instead of writing an application according to what we want to do. But even in this application writing, we can be more creative and put in more intersectional things so that that fits the call, but we are still doing what we want to do. 
Thank you so much, Tomasz Berecki and Ferenc Bajenski, for being with us today. And uh, thank you for those who are watching us uh, from home. Uh, I hope we gave you a lot of food for thought. And please uh, stay with us. This week we will have more uh, live stream interviews from here, from Amsterdam. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.